so much of my life as a defense attorney is spent telling men to break up with their girlfriends. I you, said it this past weekend. Yeah, no, that's a lot of what we do is we're like, she is going to ruin your life. We are the Armed Attorneys. Today we are talking about um, an insidious new way that the government is stripping more and more people of their firearms rights. Not just the federal government, but now we've got state governments getting on board. We're going to talk about what this particular prohibition is, how it has changed recently by the Fix the Nix Act, and how you need to protect yourself going forward to make sure you do not suffer this prohibition on your gun rights. But before we get started, share your support for the Second Amendment by hitting the like button. And to give us a little bit of background of what's going on here, this comes from one of my least favorite senators of all time, Senator John Cornyn. Oh, Richard hates John Cornyn. Yeah, just because he's a yellow belly gun control person in sheep's clothing. Uh, <laughs> Tell but, us how you really feel. But he, you know, he had been pushing for this for quite some time, the Fix Nix Act. Um you know, very rarely do bills do what they actually say they're going to do. Um, this ended up getting scooped up in, in, as part of a Consolidated Appropriations Act uh, back in 2018. But it was a, an original, it was a piece of legislation, standalone legislation for a while. But essentially it was to punish federal government agencies, incentivize state agencies to have complete records when it comes to the disposition. You know, you have an arrest. When you hear your rap sheet stands for record of arrests and prosecutions, the arrest information, the prosecution data, and the court disposition information. And you know what? People are human beings. These things aren't perfect, but it poured a lot of incentives into going back and correcting the record. And, and what they've really done is just muck things up. Uh, but we have this Fix Nix Act, and we had people who were going for long periods of time, people getting their licenses to carry, purchasing firearms, mm -hmm. and now all of a sudden they're getting these wake-up calls, they're getting letters from their state agencies saying, guess what, you can't have a license or permit anymore. Right, you're prohibited, you're a domestic violence convict. Okay, so here's what happened to a lot of these people is you get in trouble, you get arrested, you go to misdemeanor court, maybe felony court, maybe you're even in traffic court, and you're accused of using some level of force against a domestic partner. And what was happening in a lot of these cases, cases that were weaker, cases where the victim wasn't necessarily hot to trot on going forward, um, you know, cases where someone really should, probably should have gone to trial and got found not guilty, but could not afford to go to trial because that costs extra money generally. Um, and people were engaging in these plea bargains where they'd say, sure, I'll plead guilty to X. I'll plead guilty to a regular assault that's not a family violence. Drop yeah. the family violence. Get me out of jail. Right. I'll plead guilty to something else. And, you know, basically everyone was like sort of happy. Like, it's like, okay, prosecutor gets their plea. They get their guilty plea. And the person is like, I have protected my gun rights. And lawyers were advising them too. Hey, you take this plea. They're going to drop the family violence enhancement. Your gun rights are protected. And so people engaged in this, ran around with perfectly intact gun rights until John Corden came along. Just kidding. <laughs> well, it, it part of, a lot of it was, you know, the FBI started changing how they evaluated whether a case qualified or not. Right, as family violence. Yeah. Yes, and what you have to re remember is that a lot of these convictions that are coming up now, keep in mind that they're all misdemeanors. Mm -hmm. So felons have been prohibited. For, it doesn't matter if you were a felon because you robbed a bank, because you were trafficking in cocaine, or because you engaged in a crime of domestic violence. If you were a felon, you're prohibited. So when the law was amended in the late 90s to include misdemeanors, crimes of family violence, a lot of the crimes that are now being scooped up, uh, they, they didn't even have knowledge back then that it was going to... Yeah. That it was going to affect their yeah, gun. These right, are traffic, a, yeah, traffic ticket a level offenses. Yeah, well, that's a completely separate group of people, right? Because yeah. I was talking about the people who with full knowledge of the law, pled guilty, thought they were still saving their gun rights because we dropped the family violence. You're talking about those people who made a plea bargain in the early 80s, 90s, yeah. late 80s, before that even, mm -hmm. with absolutely, with no such law in existence, who then lost their gun rights maybe decades later, which is insanity. And why why did that happen? Why is that? Correct. Talk to us about why that's not an ex post facto law. Edwin Walker. Well, the courts, okay. So the courts have really, the courts really mucked this up in that, uh, yes, you would, most normal people would say that the only crimes, only misdemeanor crimes that are designated as crimes of family violence apply. The courts actually ruled that is not true and that the government can look behind the actual conviction to determine if the victim 
was a member of the person's family if it involved force, which the U.S. Supreme Court has determined is any touching whatsoever. Okay, it doesn't have to be violent. It doesn't have to cause an injury. It just has to be meet the statute of being an offensive touching, which is a lot of class C misdemeanors for mm-hmm. which you can't, you know, for which you, you, the punishment is not even going to jail, but it will cause you to lose your Second Amendment rights forever and ever. Uh, and when this law was passed, like I said, the courts have determined that even though this conviction may have occurred 20 years before the law was created, it is not, in fact, an ex post facto law because they're not judging you for what you did in your past. They're not. They're not using that conduct. They're not. They're not criminalizing that conduct that was already criminalized. What we're doing now is we're simply using that as a predicate today to determine whether or not you can lawfully own and possess a gun. And so the effect of the law occurs at the time you are denied, not. It, it doesn't mean that it's ex post facto just because it goes way far back in the past and uh, uses your conduct back then to punish you today. So therefore, it's not ex post facto. It's a very twisted uh, legal reasoning. And in my opinion, it's, it's basically uh, just outcome based. The court said, we want this to be true. And so we'll do whatever we can to make it true. And so that's why they don't rely on family violence designations. They don't rely on current crimes. And uh, they say any type of touching is an act of force that falls under this law. But Emily, you had a recent client who had a a traffic level offense, undesignated traffic level offense, and had their Texas license to carry a handgun, had renewed their Texas license to carry a handgun several times, was up for renewal recently and got that dreaded denial. Yeah, so that's why we're, we're talking about this today, because it is a good reminder um, going forward. So I'm going to tell you what to do going forward, then I'm going to tell you about what just happened. So going forward, if you are ever, 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 ever charged with anything that even resembles a domestic violence offense, even if it's that like, hey, you got to show up in traffic court because you, you know, pushed your uh, girlfriend or what have you. Heck, you pushed your brother. Pushed your brother. Yeah. Yeah. Just no, I mean, the members of yeah, your household. The government's looking at two things. <clears throat> One, was it force or attempted force? And then who is it against? Yes. And if it, if it satisfies those two, you know, if it's a current or former spouse, somebody related to, somebody you cohabitated with, um, mm-hmm. somebody similarly situated, if, it, if you have those two checkboxes, that's what the government's yes. looking at. So if you find yourself in that situation, do not ever walk into a court and just pay your traffic ticket fine for this and leave because you will have lost those gun rights. You need to take this extraordinarily seriously. Do not let any prosecutor, judge, or even hack lawyer you might hire tell you this is not a very serious Second Amendment issue. Make sure that you have someone fighting for you and make sure that person understands Second Amendment. But yes, this came up because I was talking to this gentleman who had had been a license holder for years. All of a sudden, the state of Texas was like, mm, no, 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 we're not going to renew your license because you're a domestic violence convict. Um, and sure enough, it was this old, like, basically, like, I w- had a crazy girlfriend, which uh, so much of my life as a defense attorney has been telling men to break up with their girlfriends. I you- said it this past weekend. Yeah, no, that's a lot of what we do is we're like, she is going to ruin your life. You have to stop this because you're the guy. You're going to get arrested every single time, even if, in this guy's case, he's like, I was holding her back because she was going after absolutely bat shit. And so then of course she calls the police who gets arrested. He does. He's the guy and goes in. He actually, I mean, it, t- it turns out well for him because they amend this classy level offense to another classy level offense that actually doesn't have a victim. It's a society crime. Um, and yet Texas goes in and says, aha, you were arrested for family violence assault. You pled to something out of this arrest, um, and you're still, you're still convicted. You're denied your gun rights, which is insane and wrong, and they're going to lose on this license appeal. However— Get ready, DPS. Get, buckle up. Um, however— that is the extent, that's what's bringing this up so that we're talking about it to you today, because that is the extent of the the issue here. It's not just the federal government. Now the states are getting on board to deny you your rights as well. And it is something you have to take extraordinarily seriously. I've always heard that the best way to calm your girlfriend down during a fight is to say, would you please just stop acting crazy? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Just, just instructing her to calm down. Yeah. Um, Ma'am, you're being hysterical. Yes. No, um, don't do that. But there's one, one other kind of 
provision of possible wiggle room. And the prohibition we're looking at is in 18 U.S.C. 921. And that's where we define our misdemeanor crimes of domestic violence. And there's one kind of carve out and exclusion. And we see this only come up in really older cases. We mm -hmm. don't see this happen really anymore. But if you were not advised of your right to counsel and knowingly and, and intelligently waive that right, you were not advised of your right to trial and knowingly and voluntarily waive that right. So let's say you didn't get these statutory warnings then there's a little carve out. So maybe, you know, if you have one of these really, really old fine only traffic ticket level offenses where you have that element of force or attempted force, you have it against maybe one of these qualifying people, there may still be an out here, but those records are old and the government is not super willing to be amenable to it. I mean, it's going to take some homework. And many of those, many of those records have been destroyed yeah. because municipal courts do not keep records that long. Um, and a lot of these situations do occur whenever people do simply want to, you know, they're like, look, I just want to get out. I want to pay my hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have to deal with this. Uh, but keep in mind, convictions last forever. So they do not go away. So if you were ever involved in a situation in the last 50 years where you paid a fine, did community service, you know, you, that, that conviction is, it doesn't disappear. It doesn't go away. Um, I once had a case where the DPS refused to give a man his license because they dug up a conviction in Alabama from 1962 and claimed that that was preventing him from getting, that that disqualified him for a license in 2015 or whenever it was. Wow. So they last forever. Fortunately, the federal government, um, and I have to say that with the Bipartisan Community Safe, Safer Communities Act. I can't say it either. Yeah. You said it wrong. I know. But I can't say it either. Well, that's because it's got a terrible name. Yes. Uh, but fortunately... Um, and I guess the compromises that put that together, they did recognize this inherent problem because whenever they closed the boyfriend loophole, uh, they made it only applicable to <laughs> convictions that happened in the last five years. And they said that it doesn't apply to, uh, what any, any convictions that Recent happened former before, dating relationships before the, before the law was passed. Yep. And so, yes, if you ever, you know, in the future, if you ever have one of these, you know that the disability will ultimately be lifted. You're not going to have some zombie conviction, you know, rise up from the dead and prevent you from exercising your Second Amendment rights. Uh, so at least Congress appears to have learned from their mistake. But I guarantee this, they are going to be absolutely 100% unwilling to go back and fix the problem they created because what will the news media say? The news media will say, Senator so-and-so, why are you trying to protect domestic abusers? Why do you want domestic abusers to have guns? The media and the anti-gun politicians are some of the worst people on earth. Sarcasm dripping from Edwin's voice when he says, boyfriend loop. Well, well, because then it's going to be, it's going to be a crisis of, oh, they weren't recent former dating relationship. This was a vengeful ex-boyfriend from a long time ago. We got to close that loophole. Oh no. And that's the, and the problem with these laws is that it applies to all the formers. Okay. And so you can say that, well, you know, these people were stalkers or they're harassers. There's other laws that apply to that. The, obviously the, the horrible situation that may arise is some person that you dated in college, you see them at a bar 20 years later, they have some sort of festering resentment that gets brought up to the front and they institute, they instigate a conflict now 20 years later after you dated. But since they're a former girlfriend, they're going to be considered a member of your family or household. Sorry that happened to you. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, it did not happen to me, <laughs> but I have been witness. To some... I've seen some things, but we hope you enjoyed this discussion. If you did consider subscribing, hitting that like button and help us fight the anti 2A algorithm by sharing this video. And please question and comment for us below. What do you think about the boyfriend loophole? And until next time, we're the armed attorneys.